Our program tonight uh, was given, we're going to be given by Don uh, Bissett, who a lot of you know is an avid trial bike collector and connoisseur. And uh, he's the one that helps us sponsor a field trip to Mount Laurel when we have one. He's also very prominent in the, the uh, Gem and Mineral Show every year. He's the fellow that gets all those dealers there, which pays the tab and helps us make money and fund all of the things that the dry graders do from an education standpoint. Uh, the other thing I know about uh, Don is that he's an ex uh, p and guy, retired, happily retired gentleman, out poking around in fossils all the time now. So uh, that's the best I can do, Don. That's close enough. Okay. <laughs> Jack said, I, I'm a connoisseur of trial bites, and uh, so that's what I'm going to talk about. Trial bites almost exclusively. Uh, in fact, I like trial bites so much, especially the rolled up ones that my hobby name is rock and roll. <laughs> <laughs> now, there's a rumor going around that everyone's going to get a free trial bite tonight. Uh, uh, yeah. clear. The rumor is false. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. But uh, just kind of my collecting history, I've always been a collector. When I was a kid, uh, you know, our science teacher got us involved in various things. The first thing I ever collected anything of in front of me were insects for, uh, I think, seventh grade science class or something. Then I also collected baseball cards, stamps, coins, minerals. Now, I uh, lived in New England when I was a kid, and so you find minerals there. You don't find much of fossils there. But when I moved to Cincinnati, uh, I got interested in fossils, since that's what you can find here instead of minerals. So since then, just about all those other collections have gone away, and the only thing I have left basically are fossils and a handful of minerals. <coughs> and just to be clear on the rank order of my interest in fossils, trial <laughs> <laughs> bites. But I do collect a lot of other stuff, but uh, trial bites is the baby. Or cyclophones. What? That's what I thought. Yeah, that's what I thought. Dig through them. They eat trilobites, so I don't want them to <laughs> I like trilobites and I want them all. And there are hundreds of species of trilobites that are known as complete specimens. It's amazing the diversity of shapes and sizes. And, um, it's hard to collect them all, but I can try. <laughs> So 1975 was when I got interested in fossils, and that was because of Bruce Gibson. It's unfortunate that he isn't here tonight. Um, but uh, he was also a png -er, and we met over lunch at PNG, and he told me about his fossil collecting, and he went out that night after work, and been going out ever since. That was primarily surface collecting, and I collected a lot of really nice stuff, a lot of quantity, but over time I kind of got disappointed with the quality of what I was finding, because what you find in the surface pocket is you know, broken or weathered. And then I met some other guy named Dan Cooper. Um, you probably all know Dan Cooper, who was a longtime field trip chairman of the Dry Dirgers, a longtime member. Um, and my first contact with him was around uh, fern concretions from the coal fields in uh, western Indiana, Terre Haute area. And then after that, uh, he took me out to uh, Idrio Asteroid Collecting, and that's when I first started digging, and that's when I learned the merits of how much you could get and the quality of what you get by digging uh, in this area. After that, I got into trial bikes, and then I got into the equipment for cleaning trial bikes, such as the air bracelet unit and the uh, Chicago Pneumatic, which is a miniature air hammer, and all the, you know, the microscopes and all that other stuff. And then heavy equipment for digging, bulldozers. Um, and then there was even one guy we knew had a license to get uh, blasting powder, and we could uh, blast through limestone layers. <laughs> and then leasing property, and then finally buying the property. <laughs> and so I mean, it just kind of all snowballed. <laughs> uh, Not yet. So just a, a short list of some of what I'll call the classic collecting sites that uh, Dan and I have been to. And I call them classic because these are well-known sites. The material from there is uh, you know, excellent quality. Uh, in many of the sites, you can get a lot of material also. 
Now, some of them are in red. Those are the ones I'm going to talk about tonight a little bit more. Show some pictures of some of the sites and the kind of material we can get from there. The ones with asterisks next to the, them are those where we work with some of the uh, professionals. Uh, the Monroe site uh, was for big flexicalamine, and we donated about 100 specimens to the museum center at UC at one point. And I think Brenda Linda actually used them as part of her studies. Mount Orb, uh, Brenda Linda did a dig out there, which is part of her thesis project. And then uh, Russia, New York, we've done a lot of uh, stuff with uh, Smithsonian. They picked up a lot of material from out of there. And uh, Napoleon, Indiana, which is really more of a kind of a site, although there are some trail bikes there. We donated hundreds of uh, cystoids from that location to a guy in uh, Iowa, Harold Strimple. And he studied them. Unfortunately, then he passed away. And then his graduate student passed away. And so the studies kind of got lost for about 30 years. But Carl resurrected them, and they're going to be published in January, from what Tom said when we checked into it. So finally, 30 years later, all that stuff that Bruce, Dan, and I did will get published. So, oh, there is one other thing I want to say um, around this Crawfordsville, Indiana site. You may be familiar with it. It's about three hours from here, and it's famous for these very high quality crime rates. Well, Dan and I had a uh, lease at that property out there, one of the many collecting sites there. And the layer was really hard. We had to take off about seven feet of overburden. And then we had to use wedges and sledgehammers to get the layer up. And so we put a bunch of wedges in the wall, five or six of them, just drive them in. And took about 20 swings on a wedge and moved down the line. We had one of those things going, and uh, one of the wedges just would not go on the wall. We just hit this thing, hit it, and it wasn't moving. Finally, when we flipped the, uh, the, the layer over, we finally didn't get the, the layer loose, although that one wedge never went in very far. Um, we found that the wedge had hit this huge concretion in there, and it was really, really hard. And I'll hold this up next to the screen so you can see it. But this used to be a straight wedge. And it, Hit that concretion and just bent up. It's, it's amazing. It's not cracked, it's just bent. No wonder it was so hard to drive. We were bending the metal. So that's just one of those props you kind of keep. Okay, Hamburg, New York, that was mentioned a little bit earlier, the appendixy site. Just the history of it, at one time it was a commercial quarry, and then it was abandoned, and then fossil collectors went in there by the ports to collect the site, because they had stripped it down to the shale layer, and uh, a lot of trail books were down there. So the, trail, the property was eventually acquired by the Hamburg Natural History Society as a fossil park, and the whole field trips and school group meetings, various uh, activities. And members can dig for fossils, and the dry judges go up there uh, once a year for a dig. I think you want this year, didn't you? Unfortunately, I think I had to miss that trip. Yeah, I didn't miss that one on here. Yeah. We usually go up in June. <clears throat> yeah. And earlier in the spring, we had what's called a dig with the experts up there. So Dan and I go up there, a couple other people, and Tom has been going up to kind of show the club members how to dig, because a lot of them have never dug for fossils. So we. Uh, we show them how to dig, we get a bunch of rock out of the ground for them to split down and uh, look at the ways. This is what the site looks like uh, from the edge of the property looking uh, where the stones are, uh, the big stones, that's the parking area. And uh, way in the back is where we've been digging because uh, the shale is shallower back there, so more of the shale has been stripped away. But uh, this area has been exposed like this for, I don't know, 30, 40 years. And nothing's growing there. So there's not much nutrition, I guess, in this shale for uh, modern plants. This is actually one of the dry dredger uh, trips. A picture I think I took it off the dry dredger website. You may recognize some of the folks in there. And this is a, a further way to look at the hole, at one of the holes that's been dug. And there's lots of holes all in the back of this quarry. It's been dug a lot in the back end. The one thing you'll notice in the front right corner of the, uh, the picture is uh, this pond of water. It's the one uh, complication of digging the hole is when it rains, it fills up with water. So to collect 
you know, to dig and collect, you got to be a kind of a water engineer. You got to pump water, or you got to move water somehow to get it out of the way. And that'll be a recurring theme at all these collection sites. And so we pop up the layer and split it down. And you can see the, the pile there on the right with the reject material. And hopefully you can see there's a uh, fake ops trowel bit there in the middle of that slab. That's often how they come out, you know, partially exposed. <clears throat> and then sometimes the rocks are too big, too big to carry, and so uh, I have a, a rock saw, a number of collectors have rock saws to cut it down to size. And this is a series that uh, Bob Frost took of me cutting down a rock. The start, a little further on, and then it disappeared. What you can't see is the guy's car parked to the left. Yeah, I don't know whose car it was, but it was coming. Here's another one of the things I had, the Dr. Bob. <laughs> So we go back to the uh, unprepped specimen, and here, here's one after it's prepped. Yeah. And I do have some specimens over on the table from some of these sites. I just want to take some of them a little more closely. So fake ops is what you find more commonly there. Also find uh, green ops and another species or genera called Bellicarridia, which are these kind of frilly trilobites. It's hard to find a really good one there. And Dan Cooper likes especially the rolled up ones. And he's, this is a box of rolled up ones that he's collected over many years up there. But it's hard to get really nice inflated rolled up ones. So he's kind of set those aside. <clears throat> now this is the most spectacular plate of probe ones I've seen out of there. This is collected by Jake Scabeland. And there's five complete ones you can see. There's a, a sixth one going under one there, and there's even the tail of another one in that one in the lower middle part of the picture. So there may be as many as seven trout lights there. Now, on the, another part of the slab, there are also five blastoids. Blastoids are hard to come by. They're really small. So that was an incredible slab. And it was on a rock that he pulled out of the ground and was right next to me. <laughs> <laughs> So uh, out of that site, you get a mixture of pronin and rolled fake ops, uh, occasional green ops. The trail bites are often compressed and squished sideways or pushed a little bit, but there's still some very nice material out there. Occasionally find plates with many trail bites. I've heard of plates with as many as 20 or 30. <coughs> They're usually small, but you can get multiple plates. Most I've ever found are two on a single plate. And there are other Fauna, particularly horn coral and brachiopods there. But there's also other stuff. There's some wood, there's some cephalopods, occasional crinoids, but those are the primary things. Okay. Moving on to another site, Waldron, Indiana. Don't know how many of you are familiar with this site, but it's a, it also was a commercial quarry at one time. It was abandoned and then collected heavily for many years by collectors from all over the place going there. That was eventually acquired by an individual who converted it into a campground and a scuba diving lake. Because the quarry filled up with water once it was abandoned. And it's spring fed, so the water is really clear. So they had a lot of diving uh, clubs go down there. So Dan leased the fossil collecting rights there a number of years ago. And we dug a, a pit next to the main pit because we didn't want to disturb the water and clog it all up with our, our mud. Then uh, our collecting kind of came to an abrupt end because in June of 2008, they had uh, 10 inches of rain over there in four hours. And it flooded the quarry. The, the pit we were collecting in was under uh, 15 feet of water. It was filled with mud and debris that was washed in. And, and it was a mess. It would take a long time to clean it up. No one's had the energy to go back and do that. So this is uh, kind of a view of the pit as it was being opened up. And you can see you're digging through uh, some limestone layers, the, the brown stuff at the bottom, and then you hit the gray shale layers. So that's what we're after, it's the gray shale. <clears throat> and this is a view of uh, the pit at one point. And the, the layer actually comes up usually in one to three or four inch thick layers, really flat layers. So we expose a layer, you wash it down with a hose to see what's on the surface, peel it 